the nature of what's being presented. That said, we've got a big panel as well, six, six seven presenters, I think, uh, who can talk about various aspects of, of some of this neat technology that's being developed and being used that can help provide better information for all sorts of cross-boundary cross planning and collaborative uh, understanding of these resources. Our first presenter is Tyler Erickson, Senior Development Advocate from Google Earth Engine. He'll be followed by Brady Allred, uh, the as, as Associate Professor of Rangeland Ecology at the University of Montana. Then Cindy Briere, C3WE Director, National Center for Atmospheric Research up there uh, in Boulder. Then Mike Bialush, the National Account Manager at the Environmental State Government part of ESRI followed by Jeff Sloan, Unmanned Aircraft Systems Project Leader of USGS. And then who, a question we just got from Jeff earlier, Jeff Morissette, Chief Scientist, the National Invasive Species Council Secretariat, U.S. Department of Interior. So these presenters are going to talk about uh, new technologies and cross-boundary planning, and we'll have a discussion about these technologies, what you know about them, what they know about what you know about them, and things like that. So Tyler, go ahead, the floor is yours. Thanks, John. All right, so I was gonna kick off this panel talking a little bit about cloud technologies in general, and then some specifics of projects that are going on at Google to support uh, different types of geospatial analysis. Uh, my role is a developer advocate, which means I kind of I advocate for developers outside of Google, do a couple of different things. One is uh, coming and presenting what can be done, kind of showing what the state of the art is to, to spur some ideas. And then also figuring out what communities are really actually trying to do, and just as importantly, feed that back to in, within Google so we can actually figure out where we can do better in the future, future because it's always a rapidly evolving uh, project and just technology in general is uh, moving forward quite quickly. Uh, this opening slide there is actually a demonstration of just one of the products that could come out of uh, combining a lot of geospatial to uh, data together. This is for an area in eastern Oregon along the Snake River. You can actually, the coloring in there is showing the timing of green up, the phenology kind of uh, for different uh, pieces of the landscape there. You can see irrigated crops, non-irrigated crops, forested area. Um, but it's, it's derived from a massive amount of like satellite data. And so we, we basically focus on tools that can do that compression of really big, noisy data that's being collected about the Earth into something that can, somebody can make a decision about. A little bit there. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my understanding at this point of the challenges this community is facing. And I'm, as I said, I'm here to actually learn a little bit more specifically about what the barriers are to progress. But the way I look at it is that you're trying to uh, get a handle on what's going on over a really large area. So a significant part of the United States, and you want to be able to do this at high resolution. So something that's very relevant on the ground at the same time. Uh, satellite type of information is one thing that can be used to, to get a handle on what's going on in the ground. Um, how many people are familiar with Landsat? I would imagine that this is pretty common. Okay, so that is an incredible program. It's sort of like the workhouse, workhorse of satellites if you're looking over change over a long period of time. But there's many different satellites run by many different agencies. And the great thing about this is that a lot of it has become public data. It's starting about 10 years ago with USGS announcing the opening of the Landsat Archive for free. Uh, different agencies around the world that pr run these satellites have been uh, producing data and releasing it under free and open data license. Uh, that has uh, sparked a lot of innovation and a lot of the cloud technologies in this geospatial range, which that I'll tell, uh, talk about, are really because of that opening of the data. Uh, that's, it's just been key for like spurring innovation. Um, I also want to talk about like how this has do been done in the past, especially before uh, all this data was freely available at such a large scale. But the old paradigm for geospatial analysis or remote sensing data has been largely of download a large amount of data from a data provider, whether that's NASA or USGS, ESA, NOAA. There's, there's many different providers and new ones coming online like with the drone imagery. Uh, data is expanding all the time. Uh, but 
people would download data to their local machine and they'd have some sophisticated analysis software and they'd do an analysis on it. And this is, uh, is characterized a lot of the remote sensing research that's gone over, on over the last three decades. And that can work out well for a limited amount of data, a limited amount of sites. So if you're just trying to like prove something is possible, you can have a happy user there. But when they start looking at larger areas and they're trying to draw down more and more data, whether it's looking over a long period of time or over a lot of space, you start getting impacted by the time it takes to download an image. On a good connection, a Landsat image will take about 10 minutes to download if you actually have a fairly strong connection. And you have to realize that Landsat collects that image about once every 45 seconds. So you're not keeping up <laughs> if you're trying to download the data locally. Um, it just doesn't scale very well. So you, you start becoming, as you move to uh, larger data sets going across time or space, you start getting a little bit sad. If you start now trying to pull multiple data sets from multiple data providers, you get even less happy. I mean, you're, you're basically, your pipes of the internet and the bandwidth is a limiting factor, not the creativity of the, the user at the end of the, but just getting data can, see, or can be most of your time. The new paradigm is kind of moving the questions to the data rather than other way around, and, and the cloud enables this. So these providers, um, you can download data in, at bulk over long periods of time and store it in a centralized location in the cloud, um, have these data sets mirrored there, and then move the analysis capabilities also up into the cloud. So then you can have multiple users accessing a single point. They don't have to do the same maintenance of like downloading data. It's all available for them. And it tends to be a lot happier users, I, I find out, because they're spending their time more on creative uh, solutions to the problem rather than just managing the data. So, you know, most people are happy, not everybody. Um, we present this a lot at scientific conferences, you know, what this type of cloud technology can do. And we talk with students that have been doing this, you know, as part of their coursework, uh, you know, for a project. And we'll, sh we'll ask them what they're doing, implement it in like five minutes sometimes if it's a basic question, and sometimes they're really happy, but occasionally they're not because they're like, it just took me four months of my life to do this. You know, my professor asked me to do this and I spent all this time downloading data. So there are some people that aren't happy with the, with the change of events in, in technology. Um, for Google itself, we've been, when supposed, we do have a cloud uh, platform that is just for general analysis and, and computing resources, but we've also specialized it for geospatial analysis, and that's a project called Earth Engine. And we co-locate a lot of these remote sensing data sets, weather data sets, digital elevation files, um, a lot, of, a lot of other geospatial data sets in one place, and then bring the relevant algorithms next to it so people can build upon these small algorithms and make complex analysis. And then we host it, host it in a data center, and Google is not very constrained by computation, so as we get more and more users, we just add more and more computational resources to this. Uh, and so we can serve thousands and thousands of users concurrently, all working off the same data sets. Uh, and then we expose it with APIs, which basically is just a connector to all kinds of different things that work on the internet, whether it's somebody trying to actually download the data or they're trying to connect a website to it, uh, et cetera. There's all kinds of different ways you can connect to this, this service. Uh, we have a lot of different case studies that are shown on the Earth Engine website. That it's just earthenginegoogle.com that I'd encourage you to look at, but I'm gonna just talk about a few of them that are, I think are relevant for this community in terms of what it's been used for. And we try to characterize it into three different areas. The first one I'm gonna talk about uh, in terms of applications is building new knowledge. And this is uh, kind of what the early use of Earth Engine has been for. It's basically the academic users that are trying to prove a new way of deriving information from satellite data. So they get to work with these large data sets, uh, you know, prove something is possible, write up a journal entry, publish it in like a prestigious journal. And so we've been helping them push the boundary of what's possible to monitor over large areas, uh, you know, glo international, uh, sometimes global scale analysis. Um, the second thing that we, we use Earth Engine for is just raising awareness. So just, it's not enough that this new knowledge is possible and somebody's proved it's possible, but we need to get it out to users. So in, uh, in conjunction with a lot of those papers, we help those scientists like publish the data sets in a web viewable form. So they can go in and like look at forest change um, showing the Western United States, but this is available throughout the world at 30 meter resolution 
so that people can zoom in and look at areas that have lost forest, have gained forest, that have stayed the same over that time period. This is showing the uh, area around the Biscuit Fire uh, in Oregon, so you can see a huge swath of area where forest um, was lost due to the fire, but also areas where there's uh, active management. So the blue areas are uh, where areas where forest has uh, grown up during that time, and then the purple is where it's been cut and it has to regrow during the same time. So there's all kinds of stories looking around this data set if you, as you look around the world at different practices that are changing the landscape. Uh, the second thing that we do is we build visualizations just for the general public. And this is something that's called Google Time Lapse. I'm showing you an area of Las Vegas here, showing the growth over, I think it's from 85 uh, to present, 84 to present, and the fluctuations in, in uh, Lake Powell there. But um, this, uh, this type of uh, awareness is, is really incredible for uh, just building um, awareness of changes happening, and, and it's embeddable in websites. People like show what's happening in their town by just like linking to this. Um, so I'm just showing you one little scene here, but it's available throughout the entire world based on the Landsat uh, record and other satellites. Uh, and then finally, we try to enable decision making. We have uh, the BLM is currently using uh, Earth Engine to look at satellite data before and after fires so that you can actually give really accurate maps to people that are working in the field for restoration processes. Uh, this uses uh, the European Space Agency's Sentinel data. Uh, the, the main data uh, is being provided by Earth Engine, but then the cartography on the front is actually uh, from ESRI's tools, which we hear about a little bit about later. So this idea of like providing an API allows it to integrate with uh, a lot of other tools. Uh, and then the final one I'll, I'll show is like people that are, are using this for building uh, websites that allow you to access uh, remote sensing data and precipitation data. This is something called, that's called Climate Engine, and it's an interface that allows you to select different data sources, the different variables that are derived from those data sources for particular client, or date ranges and produce these time series plots and, and show maps of what's going on in terms of change. And it's been, been used for uh, things that are like rangeland drought me measurement and other use cases. So once again, just getting these, this remote sensing and l other large data sets in the tools of the, the decision makers. So my key takeaways are that the cloud technologies are really allowing these large scale monitoring practices. Uh, it also, I didn't talk a lot about this in the slides here, but the, the ability to put stuff one place in the cloud allows collaboration from a technological perspective. I mean, you can actually share analysis just really quickly by just like sharing like a, a web address. Uh, and then finally, the, this does not um, take away from the need to collect stu uh, information, high quality data on the ground. It actually just makes it even more important that people are out in the field actually getting high quality reference data so that it can be used to interpret this data that's being remotely sensed. So with that, I will leave that for the, the or take the questions during the panel. Thank you, Tyler. Um, Tyler and I have had the opportunity to collaborate over a few projects the last couple of years, and, and indeed, without the services that he and, and the Google team has provided, uh, many of the stuff we've been able to do, um, it would have been possible, but we would still be working on it. Uh, and so it's, it's been very be beneficial. My name is Brady Allred. I'm a professor of rangeland ecology at the University of Montana. And I, I do a lot of research with the NRCS Sagegrass Initiative and Working Lands uh, for Wildlife. Um, yesterday, we, we heard about the need for data. And indeed, I, I think one individual said that he had a fear that there is a lack, that one day there'll be a question and there will be a lack of data and, and he won't be able to answer it. And so he, he wants to have that data readily available. The, the rangeland discipline in general has for a very long time recognized the need for data. Now maybe we haven't executed that need for data very well or as much as we'd like, but we understand the need for data, particularly vegetation data, so we can assess the status and trends and trajectories of, of our rangelands, of, of these working landscapes. Uh, to this end, the, the NRCS and BLM and other agencies have launched national data collection efforts, national rangeland monitoring programs, particularly over the last 15 years, in which they have gone out and collected scores and scores of data. 
on the ground, boots on the ground, vegetation transects, the stuff you, you did in your undergraduate range management and rangeland ecology classes. And they've been doing that for about 15 years now. Our question that we had is, what can we do with these data sets that have been collected and the services that Tyler just described? Now that Google and other, other companies, other entities, groups have removed the barriers on, and, on limitations and access to data, how can we use these technologies to improve rangeland management, rangeland conservation, and to ensure sustainable working landscapes into the future. So that was the question uh, that we had. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about one, one single project, and that is this idea of using these data sets to create continuous land cover maps for all rangelands in the Western United States. And by Western United States, I mean the geography you see here, including the Great Plains uh, and West. And when I say continuous, I think about these pixels or grids, historically they've been focused on categories. This is grass, this is shrub, this is tree, so on and so forth. We wanna take it the next step further and say no, this is 20% grass, 30% shrub, a little bit of tree, and the rest is bare ground. So we wanna break that information down. And so we're using Google Earth Engine uh, to do that. So why are we doing this, right? Again, if you go back to your rangeland ecology classes, you'll remember that the perennial grasses and forbs, right? Those, that is the glue that keeps rangelands together. If you lose those, you start to have vegetation changes. And so we decided using those data sets to map these broad functional groups across these landscapes. And for today's purposes, I'm gonna focus on annuals, perennials, and shrubs. And what you see there is one map it's actually at 30 meter resolution, so it's about the size of a baseball diamond, more or less. But it's one map for each one of those categories. And this is for specifically for the year 2016. So we're mapping across boundaries. We're mapping across public areas, private areas. We are doing everything that we can, any rangeland that we can see. We're using the historical Landsat archive, all images available, climate weather. We're building models to be able to predict and to map these across space and across time. This, this is important because this is the information that our rangeland managers need to manage and to plan ahead. They need to know what is the historical trends been of these areas that I manage, whether it's a pasture, whether it's allotment, a watershed, a landscape, or whether it's the entire Western United States. They need to go back in time and understand, have things increased, have things decreased? What has been the, man what has been the effect of my management actions in, say, 2005? That this is the reason we're, we're, we're mapping these things, so we can give these tools to the managers so they can make better decisions. So one of the things you can do is you can put that information together and you can get a whole view of the landscape, whether it's annuals, perennials, or shrubs, or tree or bare ground, which aren't being shown in this case. But again, we're focusing on these big areas, right? These big geographies, but we're doing it at fine resolutions. So you can zoom in and look at your pasture your allotment or your watershed and look, see how the north is differing from the south. You can see how things are changing. At the bottom, uh, the bottom down there, you can actually pick up herbicide applications that are small, those narrow strips, and see the effect that our conservation uh, uh, practices are having on the ground. The other thing we're doing is we're, gonna, we're doing this through time. So we're mapping across scale and through time. What you have on, on the bottom there is a graph that shows annuals, perennials, shrubs, and bare ground, starting in 1984 up until 2016. And this is particularly in one of those polygons up there in that picture, uh, that photo uh, image in the upper left-hand corner. And what you can see, starting in 1984, the annual cover was pretty low. It was around 10, fluctuated between 10 and 20%. But as we move forward in time, you can see how that changed. That red line increases. And at the end of, you know, around 2016, 2017, it's up to 45, 50% annual cover. This is an area uh, on the Oregon and Idaho border. Uh, actually, in particular, it's within the soda fire. Uh, many of you are, are familiar with that, that fire. And you can see the change in particular. This has changed from a perennial system to an annual dominated system, cheatgrass. If you look at 2002, you can see something happened there. 
there was an increase in, in, in those annuals, and from then on out, it became a completely different system. We had a vegetation state change. Incidentally, in 2002, there was a, there was a fire that occurred uh, in this particular area. The neat thing is, is we can now track this through time. So when these uh, fires or other disturbances or management actions happen, we can go back and see what, his, what was it historically, and that can inform us moving, uh, moving forward. Again, here is the soda fire. Burned approximately 300,000 acres uh, on, the, or on the border of Oregon and Idaho in, in 2015. So just as a, as a quick sniff test, we kind of looked at our data before and after the fire, and we saw what we expected. The fire caused a decrease in shrubs and an increase uh, in annual grasses. So I think the big question uh, that we need to ask is, now that these technologies are available, now that we can do these analyses, particularly, as Tyler said, we can do knowledge discovery, we can figure out what's going on, but we can also help build these products and these tools it, to, to provide mechanisms to help in decision making. But the question is, how do we serve these data up? How do we provide these data sets to our users, to the boots on the ground, the people that are actually making the decisions and managing rangelands in a way that they can interact with them and a way that they can understand them and work with them easily? And what, what I have here is uh, many of you are probably familiar with the Sagegrass Initiative web application at map.sagegrassinitiative.com. Uh, this is a simple mock-up where we've put these data uh, up, up on, uh, they're not up there now, but we've mocked it up so, so it looks like it. But what you see is there is an actual BLM allotment uh, in the West. And a user can potentially get, log on to a website, click on an allotment, or if it's not allotment, they can upload a file so they can look at their own pastures or their own areas, or they can draw and, and focus in on their particular area. And a graph can be produced uh, down there at the bottom. And we can provide information, again, to those people on the ground. As, as has been said before, these, these tools that we're building and this knowledge that we're discovering is not to me meant to replace uh, any decision making or any individuals on the, on the ground. In fact, they can't. That local knowledge is absolutely critical. What we're doing is building tools to help guide and to help fill in the gaps and to help evaluate our conservation practices. And by, by using services in the cloud, such as Google Earth Engine and others, you can provide that in a very easy way and very accessible uh, to the end users. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, the slides are not updated uh, yet, but um, there we go. Uh, I'm over at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is just north of here in Boulder. So it's a little bit different group than what I think has been uh, represented here before. The, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, I don't know how many of you actually know the center, but our mandate really is about research and research of all things Earth system related. Um, I am a scientist up there and I'm uh, the head of the group C3W, which stands for the Capacity Center for Weather and Climate Extremes. So my back background is in meteorology as well as environmental management. So I have two hats. Um, I am a scientist at heart, and that is what um, gets me up in the morning. But really, it is about integrating the science that I do into society. So what do we do at the Capacity Center? Well, we have two missions. Our first mission is to do science. We want to be the world-class leaders in weather and climate, and specifically of extremes. Um, climate is um, in the news a lot, although not necessarily talked about as much these days, but we, we all do know that the climate is changing and that it is affecting us. But just saying that the climate is going to change and that the um, environment is getting warmer really doesn't mean anything about us on the ground and how does it affect us and our decisions. So the second part of um, our mission for C3WE is to integrate the science that we do into the decisions that you have to make. And as a scientist, the top picture there is the one, as I said, gets me out in, uh, of bed in the mornings because I love to talk about um, 
tropical storms. Um, that is my area of expertise. And I really like to talk about um, the power dissipation of tropical storms when they make landfall. I do know that as a, um, most of the time when I talk to people, especially at a barbecue, most people have no idea what I'm talking about because I'm talking to 0.1% of the world. So my other hat is to take information like that and translate it into something that actually makes sense that, you, that anybody that needs to make a decision on, for instance, tropical storms can use to make a decision that means a little bit more than power dissipation. So how do we do this? We have created a tool called GRIT, and GRIT stands for the Global Risk Resilience and Impacts Toolbox. And the tool is specifically designed that it would help you to integrate the science that we do and ha come up with a solution rather than just science. So I'm gonna start off by giving you an example of what GRID is and how it changes information that is already readily available to something that you could use. The top figure there is a figure that I pulled off NOAA's website and that is a seasonal prediction for how temperature is going to change and that is current. And it says that for Boulder and Denver area, which is a little bit difficult to see on there, but that map is saying that for the Colorado area, we are expecting 40% increase or a 40% chance that the temperature for the current season is going to be higher than normal. Is there anybody in this room that actually me know what that means when you have to take your kids to school or when you have to make a decision about wildlife, about fires, about invasive species? I'm going to I, be the first one to put up my hand and says I'm a scientist and I don't actually know what that means for me. Because what is the, tempera what is the average temperature of Colorado? And what does it mean if, it, if there's a 40% likelihood that it is going to be warmer than average? So we want to take information like that and turn it around. And we've built a tool, and the tool that we've built was um, originally built with the construction industry in mind. But you can imagine that this can be used for any decision that you want to make. So the question that the instruction industry wanted was, how many days in this season is gonna be above 70 degrees Fahrenheit? That is information that you can use. But that is not something that anybody wants. Not everybody wants to know how many days is gonna be above 70 degrees. I am sure that somebody that has a ski resort or somebody that is working at, at DIA or somebody that has to do forest management has an entirely different question that they need to ask. So the tool that we've built is totally interactive and a user can, can go in and say, for the next three months or the next four months, what is the temperature going, or how many days will be above 60 degrees? Um, this is just a snapshot of how you do this for temperatures, but you can also imagine doing the exact same thing for how many days is it going to rain in the next season? How many days is going to be extremely cold? Or most of the time, if we have a very hot day or a very hot night, if it's two or three days in a row, it doesn't really affect anybody and it doesn't affect the decisions you have to make. But if you are concerned about wildfires, you might want to, to know how often is it gonna rain in the season? Is it gonna be dry or is it going to be wet? And how many days in a row am I going to have a, a, a hot spell? So, because that might make a difference in when you make decisions or not. The other one that I want to show you that we have built, and this one we've built for the Great Lakes. So it's an assessment tool that's available for the Great Lakes, and at the moment the assessment tool only has social economical indicators in. So for instance, things like uh, families and properties, people that's disabled. And city managers can go in and toggle all the thresholds to find the areas that is most vulnerable. So in this case, I've shown you um, areas in the Ann Arbor region that has both people with disabilities and the elderly. 
We are in the process of adding weather and climate extreme indicators. And the reason we're doing this is the Great Lakes cities have specifically come to us with a question that said, I have a limited budget, but I know that my said city can ben benefit from having more tree canopies. Where do I put it? I don't have enough money to blanket the entire city. So the questions that they want to ask, for instance, is where are the families that um, are in poverty? And the reason they want to ask that is because they know people that's in poverty probably do not have AC. And which parts of my city is going to have the highest heat stress in the next 10, 20 years? Because if I have a limited bu budget, that's where I want to put my trees. Um, I don't have examples up here, but some of the other things that we're working on is we're working with New Mexico with um, the water management. To questions that they are asking is, how is the, the snow and uh, precipitation changes going to be in the future? So can I actually plan to have snowpack that I can rely on for water? Or do I need to start putting money into reservoirs to collect water if there is more precipitation and less snowpack? Another one that we've worked on was with the northern western states. Um, they wanted to protect specific wildlife and specific bird life. They had two habitats that they needed to protect, but only enough money to protect one of them. The two habitats were distinctly different, and the specific bird that we were looking at would nest in both of those, but depending on either precipitation or temperature, they would abandon their nests if it was too hot or too humid. So the study that we've done for them is to find which one of these two habitats has the biggest probability of being favorable for the species to live in in the future so that they won't um, abandon uh, the nest. And they have put money into protecting that part of the habitat and not the second part of the habitat. So I want to end off by saying, what would a landscape style tool for the Western States look like? It's something I would love to build. We have not built it yet. But you can imagine the exact same thing with a number of layers with, that you can um, interrogate. And instead of social economical indicators that you would have at the bottom, um, coupled with your weather and climate extremes, you could potentially have things like land cover, forest, um, historical areas that was prone to wild uh, to, to fires for you to make decisions on both seasonal time scales as well as longer time scales. And I will leave it at that. up all right good well thanks everybody for um, giving me the opportunity to, to speak with you today I'm really really excited to be here um, I am going to start out though by saying that I'm actually located in our Philadelphia regional office and prior to coming here to the meeting I did know that BLM stands for the Bureau of Land Management so I just <laughs> wanted to clear that up that not all of us are like that but <laughs> so um, but actually, I do cover national territory, so I do uh, quite a bit of work out here in the western region. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is the, the ArcGIS platform, kind of where it is, and some of the related trends to the discussions that we're having today and that we had yesterday. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by saying it's not, the ArcGIS is not yesterday's GIS. Um, it's evolving extremely rapidly um, with and in the context of other technologies, some of which we've heard uh, about this morning. Um, but basically, that evolution is allowing us to leverage many, many more data sets, larger data sets, big data. You know, we hear these terms a lot. Uh, the data sets that we, the last three panelists just talked about today, allowing us to ingest those, analyze those, and use them in our processes and our workflows um, and initiatives. Um, in addition, uh, we've heard a bit about cloud uh, computing. Um, and the software is really um, available to take advantage of that. It's capable of taking advantage of that, as well as advances in server technology, uh, PC technology. Uh, the computers that we all have in our pockets right now are on the table in front of us in terms of smart devices. Um, and so it's really evolved in a way that allows us to take advantage of that as well. 
And so what all this means is that um, is innovation. It's allowing us to innovate how we're using GIS, um, how we're, it allows us to rethink how we're using GIS and apply it to certain issues and initiatives and things like that, and really expand how we're leveraging uh, the technology. Um, this has also resulted in growth of really the three core systems of what GIS really is um, at its heart. It's your authoritative system of record, of course, for location-based information and information related to that. Of course, GIS was designed to be an analytical tool, right? I mean, that was kind of at, at its inception. And this has really grown, too, basically because of all the factors I mentioned uh, relative to the last slide. Uh, but the biggest growth I would contend is in, in terms of the system of engagement. And what I mean by that is how we share that system of record, how we collaborate with it, how we share the insights that we gain uh, by leveraging GIS and by leveraging the technology for analysis and how we communicate out and back into the system as well. Um, so really it's pulling all this together and then allowing um, you know, our organizations and external organizations, the public and things like that to, to be able to, to gain value out of, out of GIS. Uh, because of the growth, GIS is now truly a framework tool uh, for supporting all aspects of workflows and initiatives like the like WGA's Invasive Species Initiative. Um, it's basically taking and turning all that data management, that visualization, that mapping and analysis, and truly using it for decision making um, and for action on the ground. What else is happening is that um, we're able to do this in a more collaborative way because we can connect all these different GIS systems together now. Uh, that's a really um, important point because we, that allows us to collaboratively approach um, issues, initiatives, challenges, things like that with technology. And um, basically I would contend that um, you know, this is allowing us to achieve a lot of the collaboration that we've talked about over the last two days. It's an enabling technology um, for that. It's truly for that now. So that's a little bit of background kind of about how things are evolving. What I'm going to get into now are some of the components, particularly the newly evolved components um, of, or categories of apps, I should say, um, of the ArcGIS platform. And I'm going to start out by talking about some of the apps that are available focused on field mobility. And really this is as far as like uh, the state usages and land managing agencies, I would say this is the area um, that's being used the most in terms of the ArcGIS platform right now is all the field mobility tools uh, that come with the, with the platform. And so these are a series of related apps that allow you to deal with all aspects of a field operations workflow. So think of like, you know, invasive species surveys or, you know, the boat inspection uh, workflows that we talked about yesterday in Colorado. Um, and basically, so what I mean by that is you've got a plan you got to coordinate and prioritize for that, those field collection for that field collection. You got to navigate and get to the actual sites uh, where you're where you're doing that collection, and then you got to actually do the field data collection. All right, and so many of our um, agencies and folks in the western states are leveraging collector apps and Survey One Two Three. Hopefully, this sounds familiar to to some of you. Um, but basically, these are these are really really nice apps for doing all the field data collection and things relative to things like I said, invasive species surveys and, and and things like that. What's different about this, as opposed to how things were done in the past, is that these apps are truly connected with your GIS implementation. And so, what this effectively is doing is 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 achieving a field-based common operating picture. So as data is being collected in the field, it's being it's being automatically in real time up updated within the overall GIS implementation. So you can immediately start monitoring that information, analyzing it, and then conversely, that authoritative information in that system of record is available to you while you're out in the field through these apps, okay? So effectively, this is bringing everything together, connecting the field with the office and the organization. And for things like, you know, we mentioned um, early detection, rapid response, it can truly support that because of this connection. Um, so like I say, this is the area where you know, the, the apps and the platform is really being used very heavily uh, by land managing agencies. All right, continuing on, some other apps, um, apps for office. So what these apps do are effectively connect GIS tools and data and technology with your business systems inside the office. So things like Excel and PowerPoint, SharePoint, business intelligence systems, things like that. It's bringing location intelligence to those systems, but also taking the information and data and functionality of those systems and bringing it to GIS as well. 
Uh, we also have apps for community, and this really gets to that system of engagement that I was talking about before. So things like crowdsourcing and citizen science, uh, open data as well, being able to exchange data openly, which obviously gets to data transparency and things like that, but in whatever format that's needed, you know, at the time that it's needed. And then another thing I wanted to point out are story maps. So telling maps through stories, that's a really technical definition of what a, what a story, or telling stories through maps, that's a really technical definition. But basically, um, we talked a lot yesterday about, okay, well, we need to convey the importance of, of why uh, dealing with invasive species is so important from an environmental standpoint, from an economic standpoint. We need to convey that information to the public and to our partners and other organizations and things like that. We also need to convey you know, the impact that our programs are having and the impact that invasive species, of course, are having on the landscape, but the imp impact that um, our programs are having in terms of dealing with those issues. Story maps are a great way to convey that information. I've seen a lot of, a lot of that being done in Western states already, and so I just wanted to point that out, that that's a really good tool uh, for you to convey the messaging around um, this initiative. Okay, so we, basically what I'm trying to get at is we have a large ecosystem of apps that are now available through the RTS platform, and I really only gave you a sample of, of those that are available. Um, Every state in the country, actually, all 50 states, including all those out here in the western states, are already invested in the ArcGIS platform for, from one, in one point or another. And so these apps are part of that investment. So they're already available um, to, to the organizations, whether federal, state, local, academia, these apps are already available to you. Um, the other thing about them that I neglected to mention is that they're configurable. You don't need to hire a developer or you know, something like that in order to stand these up. They're actually available, you configure them, um, and you go. So, you know, there, there's a lot going on here, a lot to make sense of, right? And so one thing that we've done at Esri is stand up what we call solutions. And what solutions are is they take those apps and configure them in a way to deal with a particular workflow. So a good example of this, just recently, um, we put out solutions for agricultural pest surveys. And what they, what they effectively do, the apps are configured in order to do all the surveys and inspections for agricultural pests, the uh, real-time monitoring of that information, situational awareness if a pest is detected, and then reporting to the, to the NAPIS database through USDA. So we've got a series of interrelated solutions that allow you to deal with that entire workflow, okay? Um, also, uh, crowdsourcing, citizen science, we have solutions along those lines as well. So I'm just kind of naming off a couple of the solutions that really relate uh, to the invasive species initiative that we've been talking about here. So I think all this has a lot of value and a lot of potential value for the invasive species initiative and the other initiatives that, that WGA has, but how do we bring it all together? You know, certainly solutions uh, help do that, but they really only deal with one particular aspect or one particular workflow of an overall initiative, not an all-encompassing look at the initiative. And so Esri has long recognized that initiatives really drive government at all levels, and certainly they're driving WGA, that's why we're all here, okay? And so what we've done um, in order to, to deal with that and help support that is develop a new product called the ArcGIS Hub. And what the hub effectively does is it brings together all these apps and tools and, and approaches and processes and things like that that I've been talking about um, underneath an initiative template, which basically allows for the exchange of information in and out of that initiative, conveying of information about the initiative, um, but it also promotes or provides a means for uh, partners and citizens to contribute to the initiative as well. And so you think about community building and bringing communities together, um, this is one way through technology um, that we can, can achieve that. So effectively, what the, what the hub is doing is basically connecting your initiatives with the ArcGIS platform. And what it's doing, it's a technology pattern that's really improving and promoting cross-agency collaboration, external stakeholder engagement because of the, the capabilities um, that are there. Now, I don't want to get too technical, but just take a quick look under the hood here and how this works out, how this is working. Um, at the end of the day, what the Hub really is doing is providing a branded website for you. All right? It's as simple as that. But what it does is it takes all the apps and tools that have been configured or can be configured for a particular initiative or to support a particular initiative and organizes those within that initiative toolkit. Okay? This is all configurable as well. It's kind of a plug and play kind of thing too. 
but it really can be set up in order to support all the different aspects um, of, a, of an initiative. And so it pulls together all the tools and things needed for that initiative. And if we take a, a closer look here, um, in, in particular of the invasive species related um, initiative out here in the Western states, there's already a lot of resources out there. And there's a lot of resources that we heard about this morning as well through the panel. And so this hub can basically bring together all those pieces that are already out there and, and couch them under a WGA or a region-wide initiative. And so you think of things like all the aquatic invasive species um, tools and resources that are out there in Idaho and Montana. We had a great presentation yesterday about the boat inspection and watercraft surveys within Colorado, you know, bringing that in as well. And then all the authoritative data. So the NAS program, uh, Bison, EDMAPS, IMAP invasives, all this kind of stuff can be exchanged and brought together um, through the hub as well. And so this really provides, um, you know, a nice way to bring together the initiative and to have folks engage with the initiative and all that kind of stuff. All the things we heard about this morning, too, can be brought in through the Google engine and, and, and everything else that we heard about as well. The other thing that's really great about this, um, this approach is that you can share initiatives. And so uh, one approach we've been thinking about here is um, WGA, of course, is, is, has this invasive species initiative. And so what they could do is basically be the lead agency to stand up an initiative or author an initiative toolkit um, for other organizations to adopt. Okay, so you think of uh, you know state agencies, county governments, city governments, tribal organizations, things like that could actually adopt the initiative. They could localize it to their area of interest, but they're still going to use the tools and those apps and everything that I talked about because that's what WGA could actually you know deploy for everyone, and they could bring those down into those local sites. And what's really valuable about that is that standardizes the way that data is being collected, the messaging that's happening, um, how things are being shared. And that data can then be collected at the local level or within those other organization sites, and then it automatically feeds back up uh, to the overall WGA um, hub or initiative toolkit, as I talked about here. So that's what I have for you. Hopefully I conveyed to you uh, some of the changes and evolutions within the ArcGIS platform, how it's evolved, and how it can be leveraged as a holistic uh, tool or framework tool to support initiatives like this. Thank you. Well, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Sloan. I'm uh, the, the UAS project leader uh, for the USGS out in Lakewood, uh, just straight west of here. And uh, we've been in this 10 years, so I'm the drone guy. We get asked to talk quite a bit. So just to give you an example of how wide ranging this is, we talked to third grade, just in the last month, uh, a third grade science fair. The next week was, you know, the, the LIDAR, the laser and photogrammetry stuff. The world renowned guys downtown at a conference. The next week we're down in Texas talking to science teachers. The next week down in Pueblo talking to farmers and ranchers. And I think now we're here and you're more in my crowd. So I hope, uh, hope we can show you some of this in 10 minutes. How do I move this? this way? Uh -huh. All right. So I didn't think I had to use this slide because you all uh, know how the Department of Interior is structured. But for our Pennsylvania friends, it's one out of every five acres that the, the department has the responsibility to manage. And most of you know how we're structured with the nine bureaus, uh, BLM, B Bureau of Rec, B um, Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, but we're the scientific branch of that. So we're the USGS, we don't manage land. But in order to be able to manage that amount of land, we have always used satellites, manned aircraft, whatever, to be able to take a look at that and to be able to monitor and manage at that level. At, uh, in 2008, we saw actually clear back in early 2000, um, under the Forest Service, uh, who have actually pulled way back uh, with the use of UAS and are now just starting to get back into it. But we uh, hooked up with them on some of the wildfire missions they were doing with NASA Ames and they did spin off a little piece of that to do uh, the smaller aircraft is what we're interested in. And part particularly down below about 1200 feet, that's, that was always a data gap for us and we saw that from the beginning. So even clear back in 
2004, we were looking at this and some of the big conferences going on were all military, everything was military. And we were just some of the few that said, if we can get something in the air, we can, we can make a map out of it. So that's how we got involved. Uh, as, it, as it progressed over these 10 years, it's really uh, the basics here, are just the platform, the cameras or the sensors, you collect the data, you manage the data and you archive it that, and you get it out to the, the users. But that's no different than we've ever done anything. So really it fits right into what we're doing. Uh, the platforms as we break these down, we were given from uh, the Redstone Arsenal down in, in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. They surplus some military uh, drones that they've used in a couple wars. Some of them hadn't been used, so we put those to use. Those are what you see on the left-hand side. We used those up till about 2015. But really what that did is got us into the ball game because the FAA was evolving with this as we were. They didn't know the rules any more than we did. All they knew is this was classified as an aircraft, so we have to treat it that way. So the Interior Department, it's now handled at the, at the department level. These are fleet aircraft, so if you look to the right-hand side, there's actually four categories kind of following a military setup there uh, based on weights. So those are basically sizes. Um, so not to get into it too deep, but the, the little small ones, the 3DR solos, some of you are familiar with, you may see the, the DJI products flying in your neighborhood. Uh, that's, this is very similar. They're about $500, really. You can go down to Best Buy and be flying this afternoon, except you're under the government, so you can't do it that way. Um, we do set up a week-long uh, training program. So across Interior, and all bureaus are heavily involved. We're, BLM and us are probably on the forefront, but I, th I believe we've trained over 300 people, uh, and um, I believe there's 400 to 500 aircraft uh, in the department. So it's gung-ho, it uh, it's not gonna go away because it's pretty spectacular, some of the data coming off. But, but looking at those categories, it's the small ones, and then it works it way, its way up. So we see the need for a fixed wing to cover the bigger area. This category was just announced last week, and that's a vertical takeoff and landing uh, fixed wing aircraft, so kind of like an Osprey. It just lifts up and flips over the engines and then you're just like an airplane. And, and then the heavy lifter down on the bottom, uh, that's what we, we see for lifting heavier sensors. So especially in the USGS, we have scientists that want to hang everything imaginable off of them. Uh, and so we did see a need for that. So looking at the sensors, this isn't, and a lot of people just want to know, how can I do this? I, I know the USGS can do it and all these bureaus, but how can you do it at your refuge or, or over your land? And really, you can do it. It's a small drone. These are off-the-shelf cameras. Some of them, one of our most, our workhorse right now is a $500 little Ricoh camera. And I'm coming from a mapping background. What we're seeing now uh, with these, we couldn't, we couldn't do less than five to 10 years ago with a $100,000 to $200,000 mapping camera. These are capable of doing that, especially when we're flying at the low levels. Uh, so if you work your way across there, just uh, any camera we can find, a digital SLR to a point and shoot. Uh, you work your way over to the right, the little video cameras, the little GoPros, little three ounce cameras that are very capable of high, high definition video. We still use them extensively. And then this industry is just going crazy to support it. So down on the bottom, we have thermal cameras. Uh, little clear cameras that are about an inch square, very lightweight. Uh, some of those are getting to the calibration level so we can actually get temperatures from it. And then one of my favorites down in the right-hand corner, a little uh, multi-spectral camera. So there's five different uh, pretty, pretty decent cameras in there. Uh, it takes five pictures at a time. Two of those bands are in the, the near infrared so we can start to do our vegetation uh, stuff pretty well. And that will fit in the palm of my hand. So we can get them on the small aircraft. As uh, we work to the third piece of all this, uh, you'll hear computer vision, structure from motion. These are just buzz terms. It's really just photogrammetry. All it's doing, we take overlapping images and we can mosaic all those together. Uh, the new software coming out, traditionally for us, photogrammetry software is fifty to $70,000 a year to, to keep those licenses going. Uh, this is $3,000 software. So it's very doable on a local scale. And we can create uh, point clouds, elevation, surface models, and then the, the corrected ortho image from that. And uh, down to the accuracies we're hitting uh, when we're flying at 400 feet with a, just a, a little point shoot camera, we're getting down to two to three centimeter uh, ground sample distance. So your pixel on the screen is about that resolution. 
If we lay down ground control, we can get the elevation down to about uh, regular, regularly seven to nine centimeter in the vertical, and we can tie the horizontal even better. So our whole goal is to create those GIS layers, just like we've always done. The formats are the same. They just fit right into your Esri software, into any software that you choose, but it's all the standard formats we've used with satellites, manned aircraft, and it fits right in, just a whole lot different resolution. So talking about some of the other, other sensors, one of our big roles is to try to integrate this to make sure the airplanes are safe to fly. So we've looked at LiDAR. I'll show you some of those here in a minute. Uh, um, that's on our big aircraft. We've looked at hyperspectral, if you actually know how to use that data. I, it's a challenge for me, but some of these sensors are fit in your palm of your hand. Uh, 127 bands is one that we're getting right now, and we're gonna tie that together with the LiDAR. So we have hyperspectral and LiDAR tied together. Uh, we've even done telemetry with NASA Ames that's hanging down uh, to pick up radio tagged animals. Uh, in this case, Asian carp in the Mississippi. And then over on the right, uh, that's a Doppler radar we've developed to hover over streams to get uh, mobile stream velocities and had pretty good success with that. Looking at some of the LIDAR that we're able to collect, this was for the Park Service up at Fort Laramie. Uh, but we're, just to give you an example, we're flying that at about 200 feet. The LIDAR sensor is picking up anywhere from 300 to 500 points per square meter. So if you imagine your tables there, we're getting 500 laser hits off of that from about 200 feet. And then we can start to do this type of stuff where you're getting extremely accurate elevation and uh, we do fly a digital SLR camera with that so we can colorize those point clouds. And then from that, you can create all these, the standard products that we've always done. So to give you an example of just uh, starting to pick up, <laughs> it penetrates trees, laser, that's the advantage of it. So you can start to pick up individual tree structure, uh, biomass, uh, tree heights, all that stuff. And then, of course, what we did up there was for flood modeling. So when you can create the elevation at that scale, you can really start to do some, some tight modeling and really uh, uh, fix up your modeling for the scientists, hydrologists. And I'm going to get going fast here, but some of the thermal capabilities, uh, a lot of that's used for s a search and rescue, uh, wildlife studies we can fly at night, and then a lot of stream work, too, um, for for seeps and for springs coming in there. And we are able to contract, so we flew this out in Oregon. Um, just to give you an example, we drain the, uh, drain the reservoir and then fly over as it's, as it's empty, <laughs> and then you can create the bottom. And then as they add water in, we can start to do the hydrologic work. Out in Grand Junction, I contracted this with a local guy. So to give you an example, this, since the FAA opened this up for commercial work, about 35,000 people are now out there, either entrepreneurial or tied to original companies, and we can tap those guys directly through contracts. If they're in the area, it really makes it affordable for us. Um, but anyway, just to give you some eye candy here, working with the Department of Energy. And then uh, I'll show you one more up in uh, Devil's Tower. This was using our little $500 drone with a $500 camera, and we're able to model uh, Devil's Tower just by putting vertical scales on the side. The climbers did that for us, as well as some control points around the top and the bottom. Uh, but getting uh, accuracies on that vertically, about seven to nine centimeter. Uh, in the horizontal, uh, we did put ground control down, so three to four centimeter on the horizontal. But that's not, that's not video, that's an actual model. So it can be a, a geographic product. And just a couple more here real quick. Uh, algae balloons are a big deal uh, for us, and we can use that little multispectral camera. We've developed some techniques where you can literally go down to Lowe's and buy a piece of drywall, paint it white and black and gray, lay it down while you're flying, and you can use those for calibration. So very simple. A lot, not a lot of people know how to calibrate that to get it down to surface reflectance like we've always done with satellites and, and manned aircraft. But now we can use this little camera and get that, and that's really what you want to do for temporal studies, especially for vegetation. Our office, we support the USGS, but all bureaus are, are involved. We'll handhold them. Our whole goal from the beginning was to get this into the hands of the scientist or the land manager. You can throw it in the back of the pickup and, and fly it when the day is nice, or um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really help have us come out and do it. We gotta work on a time schedule, but if you can have that locally at a park or a refuge or in the back of your pickup, pop it up in the air, that's, that's our goal. So we will handhold people to get them going, uh, how to process the data, how to fly, the whole bit. So that is what we do. That's all I got. So 
last but not least, do you get me? Again, my name is Jeff Morset. I'm with the National Invasive Species Council Secretariat, uh, looking across uh, managing and coordinating invasive species work across 13 different federal agencies and three White House offices. Uh, following on uh, my question uh, to, uh, to Doug Wheeler about the Endangered Species Act and how invasive species are a number one threat to um, it threatened and endangered species. You know, I would also add to that that when you look at threats that you have very little control over, such as geological events or extreme weather, uh, then you, you, you get that subset of threats that you actually can do something about. I think invasive species is at the top of the list with respect to competing in, the lack of competing interests. So other threats, such as agriculture, urban development, um, recreation, are all threats that have some competing interest that we actually do want to maintain or there's reasons for them being there. Whereas invasive species is something, one, you can control, but two, has very little competing threat. So I think that shows some insight on WGA with the initiative to struggle with invasives, and that's why you know, I think that uh, the National Invasive Species Council through executive orders exist and the importance of invasive species. So that's a little soapbox to start with. Um, uh, for, and so I'd like to thank uh, 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 WGA for having this session. It's been great to be a part of this panel to see these exciting technologies. Um, Zach and Kevin, who uh, helped us arrange the, uh, the panel, uh, it's been helpful. And uh, I've really enjoyed a relationship with Bill Whitaker uh, with, as he's leading the WGA's initiative into invasive species. So it's been great. And we had a really, I think, successful meeting on invasive species data uh, back uh, Wednesday afternoon and Thursday. So that's been great. And uh, at any rate, let me dig into what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to follow uh, Brent Keith's example of using some bookends, but instead of quotes, I'm going to use some stories with respect to invasive species and technology. I'm going to try to move forward. This is a, a paper we wrote back in 2006 that was a national habitat map for tamarisk. Um, so you know, Rusty's uh, talk, uh, and thanks to Kevin for letting me add this slide as well as one at the end, uh, related to tamarisk and the tamarisk coalition. And we were pretty excited back in 2005 or so to make a 250 meter resolution habitat map nationally. And so that was with the moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer or the MODIS sensor. And you know, but so think of this as 200, and this was at 250 meter resolution using the phenology of, of uh, vegetation from the MODIS sensor to determine habitat for tamarisk and then ranking the states as far as which states had the most suitable habitat. And there was an update to this and there's probably some questions about how accurate it is and it should be, and we even wrote that it should be a living map and updated. And if you think of now what we're doing with Landsat that you saw with some of the other talks with Google Earth Engine, that's, a, that's, like a, that's two orders of magnitude better spatial data and it's sort of like going from the baseball stadium to the infield with respect to the moving from MODIS even at 250 meter resolution to 30 and I think that land management decisions often operate at that 30 meter resolution or you kind of need it to be about there whereas you can do some interesting national level stuff with MODIS and there certainly has been uh, a lot that's been done. The 30 meter resolution really brings down to the management scale that I think is relevant to the interests and the stakeholders of WGA and that's the concluding bookend story I'll have we'll, we'll go into a little more detail on that. But now I'm going to focus the rest, most of the comments on what the National Invasive Species Council Secretariat is doing. We, uh, we have a management plan, and we really pretty strictly live by that management plan. And not only do we have a management plan, we have an annual report card that says how we're doing on that management plan. So we really try to hold that as, as what we do. And so it's, a, it's sort of a, a working document, and you can look at that at the, on, our, on our website. It's posted. One of the elements contained in the, uh, in the, uh, the management plan, well, I should say, like, uh, Innovation and technology is embedded in the, the, that management plan. You could say it's in our DNA, or to make a bad pun in a technology talk, it's in our eDNA. <laughs> That's a pretty bad pun, I guess. Um, <laughs> but we started with an innovation summit back in December. Thanks for laughing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We, uh, we had an innovation summit back in December 2016. It had over 400 folks, uh, and there's a document that was produced from that. And there were 10 recommendations. I think three are particularly relevant for WGA in this crowd. One was spread the word on innovation and technology, and we're kind of continuing to do that here. Uh, uh, point number four from those 10 was that high-tech solutions are on the way, and we need to be prepared for them. And I think you're seeing 
that te that technology is on the way. But that, and it's great to see the people from Esri and uh, Google Earth Engine here, because I think there is some transfer, tra some translation, some hand-holding that needs to take place, and that was kind of mentioned in that technology summit. The other is that social acceptance is, uh, is, uh, in, uh, is imperative. Uh, I think if you look at genetic modification or gene drives are the, the, the pretty uh, dramatic example of where you really do want to make sure you have uh, the social license to move into that. Or if you're flying drones over somebody's property, you probably want to make sure that the community is aware of it and, and sort of doesn't think that this is uh, sort of something that they want to resist. Uh, so uh, I, I commend that report to you as I think they're pretty decent recommendations. The, there's also a major component in our uh, management plan to focus on early detection rapid response, and this is section five of the management plan, and uh, it was an assessment of where the federal government is on EDRR tools, and two of those were really focused on the, the, uh, the technology um, and, and, and uh, 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 innovation and technology. Uh, there's a paper by uh, Barbara Martinez and Alice Fagan and others at Conservation X Labs. It's available on their website, a pre-publication version of that. And this just kind of lists some of the things you could read it there that, that, that they discuss. It's a pretty thorough paper that details how the innovations in technology are applying to in, in, invasive species. So again, you can look to that and get more information from that. We're also, uh, the NIST Secretariat is building community of practices uh, because we want to have open and honest dialogue and, and our mandate is to coordinate across the federal agencies. It is limited to federal uh, agencies. I think maybe that's why the little guy in the top there has a tie. I don't know. Um, or maybe a federal from D.C. Uh, organizing it. But I would point out what we're going to do is alternate between uh, the policy uh, and, and, and law uh, one month and then going into science and technology the other month. So I think most of the feds in the room are aware of this community of practice and we looked at that to starting in March and a little bit more coordination. So although it is limited to feds, I kind of want to let the non-feds know we are trying to coordinate and talk to each other and so we're, 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 we are doing that <laughs> in some regard. Uh, the other uh, 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 initiative that we've uh, explored and has been through Conservation X Labs and their digital makerspace is this function of challenges and prizes. And that came out of the Technology Summit as well to look at other ways to fund innovation and not just your typical grant funding cycle and mechanisms, but prizes and challenges. And so with that, we've announced three challenges uh, on the Conservation X Labs uh, site. Uh, one is with uh, focusing on rapid ohia death, early detection of that. In Hawaii, it's a very culturally important forest uh, 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 tree in, in, in Hawaii, and uh, rapid ohia death is kind of coming on, and you don't really, not much you can do about it until uh, and, and it, you can actually see that it's, it's, uh, the tree is infected. So uh, that challenge was to look at early detection of that. The other is confirming zero if you have, uh, you know, if you're doing island eradication of mammals or other invasives, you can spend a lot of time digging in to find out that you haven't, uh, that, that nothing's there. And uh, the, the current schedule is like go every two, uh, monitor for two years. But you know, could it have been two weeks and you would have known that nothing was there? Or does it really need to be five or six years? And I think that that challenge relates to some of the weed control, you know, with the seed bank. How long do you have to keep going back? Uh, the other is uh, is uh, chytrid fungus or B cell and amphibians and how to do a detection of that. So those are three challenges that we put out there. One of them, the rapid ohia death, may have a prize fund associated with it, uh, depending on working out the details with, with the accounting. That would be a $90,000 prize to, to move forward with that. And Alex Dagan has worked with the, the X Prize competition and the chief scientist on Conservation X Labs works with the, the X Prize Foundation. So we're trying to leverage that sort of funding mechanism or is that that's sort of an innovative way to, to generate ideas and uh, we're exploring that through those three challenges. Um, now I'm going to conclude with the, the story. This is an interesting, so you know I was pretty excited to start working with Bill Whitaker and I think I uh, kind of relayed this story to him when I first started working with WGA on the Invasive Species Initiative uh, that back when uh, uh, NASA was deciding uh, what to do with a limited budget on Landsat 8, uh, had decided not to include a thermal sensor. So traditionally the Landsats, I think, four, five, and seven all had, um, Landsat six has excellent repeat coverage. It's just at the bottom of the ocean. So, um, but Landsat four, five, and seven, that was another joke, but uh, the four, five, and seven, it failed at launch. It, four, five, and seven uh, had thermal sensors. Uh, the plan was to not have a thermal sensor on Landsat eight, and it was a lot, not a uh, lot, 
education or incentives that WGA put to the federal government to say, to stress the importance of having a thermal band with respect to, the only way you can really see water use of plants or the best way to get at water use in plants is that thermal band because when plants are photosynthesizing, the evapotranspiration is high and they're actually cool, much cooler than the ground uh, around them or plants that are sort of not being irrigated and not uh, uh, doing a lot of photosynthesis. So the thermal band's important and the WGA was really what lobbied to have that thermal band put on Landsat 8, and now it's kind of exciting to kind of come full circle with a slide I just got from my friend Gabriel Sine yesterday. I wrote him, and I was like, can you give me, what, what's the latest on your evapotranspiration map at 30 meter resolution, which is using Google Earth Engine to be produced, and I think on there he says how many scenes that are being used. So this is the first time ever, continent lower, US, lower 48, evapotranspiration map that's being done via Google Earth Engine and USGS and DRI to, uh, to produce this high resolution map and a little zoom, zoom in there in Nebraska where you can actually see a lot with respect to water use. So I think this picture, I think that's the last of my slides. So it's interesting to think that invasive species and a lot of the problems that we're addressing and discussing here have cross boundary issues. Invasive species certainly don't respect boundaries but technology doesn't rely on them or respect them either. A lot of the technology that we're looking at you know, is applicable across uh, the landscape and for cross-scale cross, uh, cross or cross-boundary work. So maybe that's the encouraging part of what we've got with technology. So thank you. So if you grew up liking maps like I did, wow. Stuff's amazing. But, but before we get serious, Jeff, is there any correlation between the growth of drones and UFO sightings? <laughs> I just wonder sometimes. All right. There's a question I, that's, I think, that's the obvious question to ask first, uh, certainly on my mind. What level of training or, or scientific background do land management and, or, uh, and others need to use these tools, such as Google Earth Engine, GIS, and how do we acquire that training to be able to do it? So I'm sure a lot of us have that on our mind, so fire away, anybody. With uh, Tim Kern, a, a, uh, an analyst and uh, uh, leader of the program development team at USGS, uh, pointed out several years ago to me, he's like, you don't really need to work with land managers, you need to work with their trusted analyst. That is, you know, I think in a lot of cases, uh, you know, there's somebody who's responsible, the park superintendent. You know, he's, he probably doesn't need, he or she doesn't need to learn how to run drones, but there might, you know, there's somebody at the park and, you know, uh, quick studies and, and there's the GIS person. That's, I think, a lot, you know, you can find that, that niche of that person. So I don't think, you know, we have to do everything to all people. You just got to make the connections. And I think the trusted analyst to me was a neat phrase to remember with respect to getting at kind of in the land management agency work. Fire away, whoever. Um, really does not require any training for you to use them because we try to build them to be very interactive and intuitive for you to use. But I think the part for us that has been really valuable is to work with stakeholders so that we don't just build tools that we think people want and throw them across the fence, but we build tools that really people need and that they can use so that the initial building is built around people's needs and that actually takes away a lot of the training that you need later on. What we have found is that um, a lot of the, the, the users and stakeholders that we um, are working with needs more information and training on the science part and actually how, what is available in, in the science that they can use and integrate into decision makings. And NCAR has started a, a whole series of training specifically to, to address that. So I think that if, gen, if people in general need that, that is available. Um, I, as far as um, the ESRI tools go, um, I don't think anybody heard me mention ArcMap, ArcGIS Pro, anything like that. Um, what, what's going on with the evolution of, of the tool sets is that it's much more web-based now and very app-focused. Configurable apps, you know, things like that. So the training curve, what we found, has actually gone down uh, quite a bit. 
uh, because of this approach. You don't have to learn an entire desktop package in order to do GIS work anymore. Uh, it's very web-based, which we're all very used to, obviously, web-based kind of tools. Uh, the other thing I would add, too, which kind of uh, tacks on to what, what you guys said, is that uh, the other concept that we have are what we call Esri user communities. And so as part of um, the, the GIS implementation, we stand up these user communities, which are basically, you know, social media, blogs, uh, user groups, you know, things like that, but focused on particular industries, okay? So we have one for forestry, we have one for agriculture, and so on and so on. And what we find with that is, is even though these, these apps and these web-based tools are, are much simpler to use, they're still best practices, there's still lessons learned, you know, things like that. And oftentimes that is just as valuable or more valuable than training, is being able to interface with subject matter experts, other implementers of the technology, you know, that are focused on similar things as you are. And oftentimes that's the training that you need. How have others done it? And so we can accomplish that through Esri user communities as well. So, uh, so I'd say our approach on Earth Engine is that uh, we're a very small project by Google standards and we have a very small audience relative to other Google projects. So we focus on training the people that can actually make effective use of it, that like Gabriel Sané from USGS that was mentioned doing the map transportation work, Desert Research Institute, uh, Brady's uh, research group, empowering those type of people to do things that they just couldn't do before. And in turn, we realize that they can multiply and reach thousands of people in their particular community. Uh, so that's how we've focused a lot of our training is just towards developers thinking that they will build another layer, and they have, to reach much larger communities. Uh, and those tools are very simple and easy to use. I think the really neat thing about many of these cloud technologies is you can hide them behind a curtain. And so the end user doesn't see all the technical things and all, all the work, all the development that goes behind them. And you can build an application in front of that. And I think the theme we've all been talking about it are web applications that are accessible via the web or via some other platform. That that can be built, tailor, you know, custom to your specific audience. And like Cindy said, working with your audience, working with your stakeholders, uh, doing that co-production of science and analysis to build what they need. And they never have to see all the details, all the heavy lifting that goes on behind the curtain. Okay. Um, a lot of you already used some good examples about your technology being used to make better decisions. I thought I'd at least ask anything else you wanted to mention, any other examples that this audience might like to know that helped make a better decision? And if not, that's fine. I just thought I'd throw that out if anybody wanted. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that something we did with this agency or so forth. Pretty well got that, that covered. So Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I could sit here for the rest of the day and talk about okay. <laughs> examples and things because of the pervasiveness of our technology. but. Uh, related to invasives um, in particular, and not necessarily in this area in some cases, but um, uh, in Missouri, uh, all the hydrilla surveys that they're doing are leveraging the tools that I talked about and the monitoring, you know, relative to that. Uh, we talked about watercraft uh, inspections and boat surveys and things like that. That's being done uh, leveraging these tools as well. And what, what they're finding is that the ability to monitor that information in real time and get that information to who it needs to get to in real time has really been uh, a huge, huge benefit. Um, the other area I would say too is forest health. So forest health surveys, you know, um, uh, insects, disease, you know, that kind of thing. I haven't run across a forestry department yet that's not leveraging our tools in, in that manner. And again, that common operating picture that I tried to, to convey to you before is really huge uh, relative to being able to deal with and respond to the things that are found through forest health surveys, so. I would say just as a general class, a lot of the uh, information derived from satellite data you can look to areas outside of the Western United States because the satellites don't really respect borders so much. So there's a lot of interesting rangeland work that's going on in Australia where they have a lot of the same issues and doing a lot of interesting development. And then also the concept of drought, which is very important uh, for this region. It impacts many parts of the world. So a lot of the evapotranspiration work that's being done here in the United States, it's very applicable for like uh, response in Africa when they're trying to figure out food security. So I just, uh, I, I would definitely encourage you to look for solutions that are outside the United States because there are a lot of similarities uh, in what's going on around the world. I just can add real quick. 
quick, just the drone technology. Um, it's not limited to looking straight down. You can look straight ahead, you can look up. So even for infrastructure such as like the arches out in Utah or bridges or whatever, we can start to look up and start doing um, vertical surveys for dams and that type of stuff so that just the capability with them and the mobility, safety, and cost. It's, uh, you, you, you do the math there. Is there any, are there any challenges when using these tools across ownership boundaries? For example, Jeff, obviously you have already brought up using drones um, if you're d monitoring or looking at something on public versus private land. Um, any other sort of challenges there that have to do with ownership or is that really not an issue that's come up for folks? Oh, well, for us, it comes up all the time. We're, um, we're the government flying drones, so right away, we got the labels. We've, the FAA does not require that you get land approval to fly over them. The, the Department of Interior has placed that upon ourselves. So we, if we do, we are allowed to fly over private land and all our federal lands, but we have to get approval from not only each individual private landowner, uh, but also from our sister agencies. If I'm flying in the parks, and probably a lot of you know, they've been banned from early. We have to go through an approval process and the superintendent has the, the right to say yes or no. So we follow all those very, very closely. But it, you know, that can be, that can shut you down real easy. If I'm flying, like we flew in Cape Cod, there's tons of private land holdings over the, uh, near the park service area there. So we, uh, all they require that we do is put up a post. We, we can run it in the newspaper, have a little community meeting, uh, but put signs in the visitor center, whatever we can do, as long as we've made the attempt that we're not, we're, we're with the government and we're flying drones. And then after that, we, at least with the USGS, we make that, all that data publicly available through our Aero data center. It, unless there's a reason to keep that sensitive for archeological reasons or mining or whatever. So that's what, that's the rules we follow. So our group work a lot with sensitive data. So we l work a lot with um, city data, where um, the, the water is, where's the groundwater, but we also work a lot with um, insurance and reinsurance industries because reinsurance industries use our tools to actually use for price setting. So we have a tool that specifically helps them do price setting for, for hurricanes um, and because of that, the data that they, that they use to base their price setting on is obviously very sensitive because, first of all, it would expose the companies that they work for for the liability that they potentially could have, but also it um, is proprietary data for them because their competitors would like to know what exposure they have. So we definitely run into a lot of that. So we, what we have to do is either put data behind firewalls um, or certain tools do not have the, the data layers that are sensitive or aggregate the data layer so that whoever is using the data simply do not know where it's coming from. So it's a big problem for us. So I'd actually like to add on to, to both of these, these points. So um, as far as the drones, I, I think one of the uh, key things that I'm seeing is just a lack of awareness, um, especially with say, I don't know how many states I've gone into and of course, we have an app for, for drones and <laughs> you know, relating it back to, to the ArcGIS platform. And so I often talk about that. And agencies are like, well, I don't really know if I can fly a drone. You know? And largely, it's you know, all the FAA regulations, the other um, you know, um, factors that you were talking about as well, Jeff. And so that awareness of even if they can leverage that technology is not always there. And I often find myself helping them through that, and which is a, a complicated web of, uh, of, of things. And then the data sensitivity issue, the, the technology, and I don't think it's just our technology by any means, um, has really advanced to a point that you can actually um, store that sensitive information, but then only convey out to certain groups the information that's appropriate for them to see. And so all the, you know, oh, I've got to take this and extract it and strip this out and do this, all that manual kind of processing that you needed to do in the past, not necessarily required now because of how the technology's evolved um, basically from an identity and security standpoint that you can actually manage it centrally and then parse it out in a secure way um, that you need to. And that includes within the cloud as well. And I run into that all the time too of, oh man, I can't put my information out in the cloud. Who's gonna see it? Who's gonna get it? Well, oftentimes the cloud is even more secure than a lot of state systems in particular that are out there, so. 
Uh, I would say one of the barriers that I encounter the most is just the availability of data. We're talking a lot of large amount of remote sensing data, but it, uh, you know, it's, it's still limited by the amount of ground reference data, as I mentioned before, used to interpret it. Um, there's some groups that have been doing really good work on, on opening up and making accessible the, the ground measurements, like the BLM has uh, released quite a bit of their uh, repeated sampling on there. But it's not as easy to get a, a, a hold of that as it is to get a hold of the remote sensing data. So um, just similarly to the benefits that I think the USGS and NASA had from opening up the Landsat uh, archive and making it freely available, I think a lot of the custodial, uh, custodians of that, those data sets, if they made them available, a lot of people could help them make them useful. John, I think, I think there's, a, you know, there's the concerns about public and private, but I think there's also a tremendous opportunity here uh, in that I think it was said yesterday that you know 50 percent uh, of the wetlands are are on private lands, and you know our private lands are our most productive lands in the country, and they're America's greatest natural asset. And I think with these new technologies and the ability to actually observe them and monitor them, we have we have the opportunity to tell that story and to get greater conservation done. Add to what uh, Brady said, and I think if you look at that innovation summit report and the required, you know, kind of social acceptance being in, in, in important, I think what we've heard, if anything, over the last day and a half here is that it is not just a challenge but an opportunity to engage the, those cross boundary uh, constituents and stakeholders early and you know see what they have to say and don't be don't try to use the technology without sort of letting them know what you're doing and get their insight and you know kind of how best to use it and what opportunities are going to be there. So. Out of time, uh, if you do have questions, I'm sure the panelists will be around for you to approach them one-on-one -on -one to, to get your concerns or questions answered. Uh, we're going to take a break here in a second.